into it. We are in the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 3. And this message is deeply, deeply theological, and I'm going to do my best to not make it feel like a classroom, um, but we're going to be teaching this morning. We're going to be teaching this morning. Here we go. Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3, the Word of God says, starting with verse 1, then the Word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Remember the first time it came to him? Jonah did not listen to the Word of the Lord and went the opposite direction on his way towards Spain. Uh, but after God had rescued him with the fish, and after some more uh, uh, contemplative time, uh, focusing on the goodness of the Lord, Jonah hears this message again. Go to that great city Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. For those of you who don't know, it was the capital of the Assyrian uh, civilization. Um, their army was there. The, 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 their wealthiest people and the most corrupt people were in this city. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be what? Overthrown. We're going to put a pin on that word. We're going to put a pin and we're going to come back to it at the end. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. But let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? Who knows? God may yet relent. Some versions say God may yet change his mind. And with compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Verse 10 says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the space that we have right now to focus on you and your word. Help us to have understanding. Help us to see you in all of this. Father, help us to understand your purpose, your will. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Let everyone say Amen. God changed his mind. God changed his mind. The King James says he repented. He repented. In the same way it says in the Old Testament with Moses that he repented of what he had threatened to do to Israel, speaking with Moses. God repented. That word repent simply means to turn away. We talked about that last week, to simply turn away. Away. So God turned away from his anger, according to the king of Nineveh. He turned away from his anger, and, and, and he changed his mind. How does that sit with you? According to Jonah chapter 3, we just read, God gave a prophetic word through the prophet. Now, a prophet, his role in Hebrew is simply, literally, to be a mouthpiece for God. Prophecy is to proclaim the word of God. Now, we see prophecy as synonymous with predictions, forthtelling, right? I mean, for, I mean, foretelling, foretelling. But prophecy is also forthtelling. It is simply giving the word of the Lord to the people. And so prophecy has multiple purposes. And I want to share what I think are the three most important uh, 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 aspects of prophecy Prophecy will share God's purpose for us. Prophecy also can have the nature of being predictive, telling us what will happen, foretelling. And prophecy has within it my favorite, and that is promises. And so the role of this prophetic message was what? Was it predictive? It was predictive. How do we know it was predictive? There's a time attached to it. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown. Some versions will say uprooted. Nineveh will be overthrown. It was time-based. It was future-focused. 
It was a clear, thus saith the Lord, and there was no wiggle room. God had come to Nineveh in order to visit judgment on these people. Now, just in case you don't know about the wickedness of Nineveh, the prophet, the prophet Nahum talks about them. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there. We'll have it on the screen as well. Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. Nahum chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. The Bible tells us, Woe to the city of blood, full of lies, full of plunder, never without victims. The crack of whips, the clatter of wheels, galloping horses, and jolting chariots. This is wartime. These are the tanks. This is military action. Charging cavalry, flashing swords and glittering spears, many casualties, piles of dead, bodies without number, people stumbling over the corpses, all because of the wanton lust of a prostitute alluring the mistress of sorceries who enslaved nations by her prostitution. Now, back in the day, I know some of you used to hear this kind of stuff too, when I was a young boy, I used to walk to school in the snow, five miles barefoot. Remember those stories? When we begin to complain about having to ride the bus, my son has no idea. He gets dropped off at the school's doorstep. I would have to be on the bus two hours to go to school and to get back. And my parents and grandparents would tell me how they used to walk five miles in the sleet and snow. And here we have one of these old time stories where, where grandparents could talk about how they used to walk to school, except over dead bodies. You wanted to go to the local Walmart? <laughs> well, you are going to have to hurdle some dead bodies. This was called the city of blood. Children would walk outside to play football and they would see the streets littered with dead bodies, corpses. Nineveh was not Las Vegas. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't old retirees uh, around, huddling around slot machines and, and wasting their money. No, 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 no. We often like to think that this is the kind of sin that really gets God upset. You're drunk? Oh, I'm going to step, I'm going to step on you now. No, 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 no. When God stepped in these kind of situations, it was because the wickedness was terrifying. Maybe like Las Vegas, Nineveh was the city that didn't go to sleep, but for the wrong reasons. People didn't sleep because they were afraid their neighbors would come in and steal and kill. Can I say something real quick here? Not even the wicked cities liked living amongst themselves. You think thieves like living next door to a thief? You think a murderer wants to live next door to a murderer? Not even evil likes itself. These cities were so corrupt, it was torture to live in them. And so God said, enough is enough. Your iniquity has reached its limit. I am coming in to police this situation. No more. 40 days and you will be overthrown. So Jonah does his part. As a faithful prophet, he does his part. Yet we're told in verse 10 that God changes his mind. Why, family? Why? Justice must be given. In Jeremiah 18, 7 through 10, we are told why God changes his mind. Jeremiah 18, verse 7 says, If in any time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be uprooted, torn down, and destroyed, and if that nation I warned repents of its evil, then I will relent and not inflict on it the disaster I had planned. And if at another time I announce that a nation or kingdom is to be built up and planted, and if it does evil in my sight and does not obey me, then I will reconsider the good I had intended to do for it. Are you listening to the word of the Lord? In other words, in other words, God is saying, if I prophesy that a city will be destroyed, but they repent, 
even though I prophesied what would happen to them that would be obviously negative, it will not happen because they have turned away from their sins. And if I have prophesied that a city would be prosperous, it would be blessed, but they begin to do wickedness in my sight, i.e. Israel, (laughs) i.e. Judah, then whatever I had prophesied or promised, I will no longer give that to them. I will reconsider, the version says. Well, this kind of turns things on its head because I grew up in this church, the Seventh-day Adventist church that believes they have the monopoly on prophecy. Oh, we know prophecy. We get our doctorates and our PhD in prophecy. We are, uh, uh, by our own admission, the last day remnant church with the last day message because we understand Daniel and we understand Revelation. We believe that we have a prophetic word. In fact, one of our leaders in the church, her writings we call the spirit of prophecy. That's kind of bold, don't you think? Those little red books, prophetic words, And I always understood that when God gave a prophetic word, it had to be fulfilled to the letter or else God would not be truthful or else God's word would not be sure. And Malachi 6 tells us that God does not change. Except here and except with Moses And I can go on and on of many situations in the Old Testament and the New Testament where it seems that God changes his mind. Does that make you feel a little little uneasy? Well, pastor, you just found Jeremiah. There's no other text like that in Scripture. Well, Ezekiel chapter 33. It's in Ezekiel 18, but for time's sake. Ezekiel 33. We'll also have that on the screen. Ezekiel 33, starting with verse 13, says, If I tell a righteous person that they will surely live, but then they trust in their righteousness and do evil, none of the righteous things that person has done will be remembered. They will die for the evil they have done. And if I say to a wicked person, you will surely die. Where have we heard that before? You shall surely die. Where have we heard that before? In the Garden of Eden, he told Adam and Eve, you will surely die. He says, even if I say you will surely die, but they do what? Turn away from their sin and do what is just and right. If they give back what they took a pledge for uh, a loan, return what they have stolen, pay their credit cards and school loans. Oh, come on, we got to read that stuff into the text. Follow the decrees that give life and do no evil. That person will surely what? Live and they will not die. None of the sins that person has committed will be remembered against them. They have done what is just and right and they will surely. It makes me wonder if Adam and Eve had not ran from God in the Garden of Eden and simply ran towards him and repented immediately instead of playing the blame game, I wonder what would have happened. Hmm. Is that okay for us to just ponder that for a moment based on Scripture? This this is something that you have to understand. God's posture has always been this. And just in case you think I am really out here on a limb, can I say something else? According to one of those red books, Patriarchs and Prophets, in the in the spirit of the spirit of prophecy, Ellen White says that 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 Lucifer, after spreading his lies and creating dissension all throughout heaven that God had a meeting with him and set him straight and, and he knew that he was wrong and he then offered Satan his position back as covering cherub. Watch this. My man Lucifer sinned. He lied. He allowed his jealousy to get the best of him. He coveted also a sin, right? He broke a number of laws. God said, hey, man, let me set you straight, and then says, I'll give you back your spot. And watch this. There's no cross involved. There's no bloodshed involved. 
a simple I forgive you, would you like to return? This is something we have to understand. We have made forgiveness for God this most complicated thing. Well, I can forgive you if I do this, 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 and this. And then, maybe then, I'll forgive you. Good old-fashioned forgiveness. And in this situation with Nineveh, he's following a template. And how do I know he's following a template? He's following a template because of what Jonah chapter 4 says. Jonah chapter 4, which we will spend more time next week on as we close out this series, where Jonah says, I knew that this is exactly what you would do, and that's why I didn't want to come. Whoa, 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 whoa. Jonah, how did you know that God was going to do this? Because he always does this. How do you know? Because every single time I'm prophesying, telling a wicked nation that they're going to be overthrown, oh, they repent, and God gets all mushy and wants to put his arms around them and says his grace is sufficient and all this other stuff, and I look like the false prophet. No, 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 not for Nineveh. They deserve to die. I don't want to be anywhere near there, and I'm not about to look bad on television. Not there. At the Capitol? Heavens no. This is God's MO. If I tell a nation or a person they will surely die, but they repent, they will live. Now somebody wants to tell me, I know, I know. Verse 17, verse 17. You want to say this. Watch this, watch this. Verse 17 of Ezekiel 33. We just, we just read all the way up to 16. Verse 17 says, yet people say the way of the Lord is not what? It's not just. He says, but it is their way that is not just. He's even echoing what we believe. That's not fair. That's not fair. That's not just. Can I tell you something? God ain't fair. He's not. You thought he was fair? When did you think he was fair? If he was fair, you'd be dead. If he was fair, you'd be in jail right now. No, I've never been arrested. Just because the cops didn't catch you speeding, God did. God knows what you're doing at all times on Bathsheba.com. He knows. You're guilty. Just because you're not caught by the authorities doesn't mean that God did not catch you. He knows when you're cheating on taxes. He knows that when you give to a foundation just to avoid more taxes, your heart's not even in the right place. You're motivated by money, not by generosity. Oh, you weren't ready for that one. God knows. If God was just you and I wouldn't be here. I would have been fired a long time ago. Yes, I think you should appreciate your pastors. But straight up, if God were to reveal all of my stuff, I would be unhirable. But so would you. God is not just. He's not fair. And thank the Lord, he's not. Because grace ain't fair. It's unmerited. It's unearned. And we are grateful for that. I am so glad because God's unfairness is always in our favor. Somebody say amen. His unfairness is always in our favor. Watch this. Isaiah chapter 55. We're going to have it on the screen as well. Isaiah 55 says, see, verse 6 says, seek the Lord while he may be what? Found. Call on him while he is Near, let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will what? Have mercy on them and to our God for he will do what? Freely pardon. That, is a, that again is unmerited favor. That's mercy. You didn't earn it according to Romans chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. This is what God chooses to give to you. Now everyone who has used this next two verses, they always use it out of the context of the actual passage. This is when God says, for my thoughts are not your 
thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Aren't you happy our ways are not God's ways or his ways aren't our ways? He's not petty like we are. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Every time someone wants to quote this text, it's, it's in the context of God doing something that seemingly looks evil. That seemingly looks out of character. No, 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 no. God says these words in connection to his mercy that we think is unfair, especially when it's given to others that don't deserve it. No, 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 that's not fair. You're giving freely pardoning? They have to pay for something. What do you mean? All they have to do is turn away from sin and, and you will remember their faults no more? That doesn't even happen in our system of judgment. Man, we have to go to court. We have to pay some fine at least. We have to do some community service. There's something. The, the judge may give us a lighter sentence, but somebody is paying. So God stands up against Nineveh. He's had enough. But once Nineveh changes their minds, once they change their minds and repent and turn away, God then also repents, meaning that he turns away. He changes his mind and does not bring about the disaster. Can I share something with you that I think is so deep? I believe this was God's intention all along. I do. I believe it is always God's intention to get us to a place of authentic repentance. I believe that everything that God does and everything that Jesus did always had a redemptive theme, always had a redemptive thread, always had a redemptive purpose. In other words, when God gives a prophetic word, his desire, even if he is foreshadowing the end of time and cataclysmic disasters, his purpose all along is to bring people back. You don't believe me? I don't know why you guys don't believe me. Revelation chapter 16. I'm going to bust out the, the bowls of judgment. The ones where we feel like the wicked have no shot. They have already, it's been sealed. It's done. They've made up their mind and God is through with them. Revelation chapter 16. Revelation chapter 16, starting with verse 9. It talks about these bowls of judgment being poured out, that God's wrath is poured out. It says they are seared by the intense heat and they cursed the name of God who had control over these plagues. But they refused to do what? Wait, 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 what? What do you mean they refused to repent? They couldn't repent anymore, right? They refused to repent. They refused to repent and glorify him. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tons in agony and cursed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, but they refused to what? Wait, what? Why is this even written here? They, they, they refused to repent because they, they couldn't repent anymore. There was no more opportunity for, for them to repent. Listen, watch this, watch this, watch this. God's wrath being poured out, according to Revelation, according to what Paul says in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9, God pouring out his wrath is God removing his hedge. It is God no longer holding back the winds of strife. Strife does not come from God. Strife has always come from the enemy. Strife has always come from sin. Oh, but we were talking about it this week at the academy, talking about Gideon all throughout the week. When God removes his hedge, the enemy will implode. They fight themselves. So God removes his protection, and when he removes his protection and no longer filters sin, because right now, the only reason why we have not felt, felt the full brunt of sin is because God is still filtering. Amen? His spirit is still striving, but one day he will remove it out of respect for their choice. He will remove it. And even in his removal of it, it's not punishment. In his removal of it, he's hoping it opens your eyes. 
He's like, listen, I've been trying to warn you about the enemy. I'm telling you, he's no good. It is awful. It's hellish. But I'll, if, you want, if you want to drink a little bit more from this cup, go for it. But I'm hoping once you taste the bitterness of sin and you get down to the dregs that you will realize what I have for you is so much better and you will return. Isn't that what happens with the prodigal son? Once he's drinking the dregs, eating with pigs, does he finally say, I need to return home? Even in these moments of judgment, when we think God has lost his temper, he's still trying to redeem and restore. He's still trying to bring his babies back. I'm telling you, he, he, the enemy doesn't love you. He doesn't like you. Whatever he's promised you, it's all lies. But but if you, if you want to go out on another date with him, sure. But I'm hoping after this bad date, you'll return. You think I'm still making up stuff. And one of my favorite quotes, Prophets and Kings, page 276 and 277. The author says, God allows men a period of probation but there is a point beyond which divine patience is exhausted. All right, we'll, we'll clarify what that means. And the judgments of God are sure to follow. The Lord bears long with men and with cities, mercifully giving warnings to save them from divine wrath. What is God's wrath again? What is God's wrath? It's removal, right? This is exactly what Jesus felt on the cross. This was the pain and suffering that crushed his heart. My God, my God, why have you left me? Why have you abandoned me? The Lord bears long with men and with cities, right? Mercifully giving warnings to save them from divine wrath. But a time will come when pleadings for mercy will no longer be heard, meaning that God will allow them to experience the consequences of their choices. This is not arbitrary, by the way. I, boy, if I could get into more of this, I could. We just don't have the time. But just know, even this is not arbitrary. This is not God saying, all right, based on what you did, this is what I'm going to do to you. This is simply God saying, all right, thy will be done. Watch this. And the rebellious element that continues to reject the light of truth will be blotted out in mercy. To who? Y'all don't get this. <laughs> you don't get this. Nineveh was already living in hell. We keep thinking that God's act is simply one of just justice and judgment. God going to Nineveh was always a mission to save to save them from themselves, to save them from their current circumstances and suffering. This was his purpose. He, 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 God will allow them to be blotted out in mercy to themselves and to those who would otherwise be influenced by their example. That means that every time God acted, it was always in mercy to the offenders and in mercy to those who were living in fear of those wicked cities and nations. Even when you look at the story of, of Sodom and Gomorrah, and most of us misunderstand exactly what happened there, and again, I don't have the time to dig deep into this, but most of us look at Sodom and Gomorrah, and we think the reason why God stands against them is because of sexual immorality. But we read in Ezekiel 16 the real issue with Sodom. God calls it out, in fact says to Israel, you did worse than your sister Sodom. Your apathy is worse than Sodom because that was God's issue with him. Even when we want to look at Jude, and, and of course a lot of this is mistranslated, when it talks about those in Sodom uh, uh, going after strange flesh. The actual Greek word is they went after hetero flesh, different, other flesh. They wanted to commit violence to angels. Angels, read the context of this. They were willing to abuse angels. And when the Bible says in Genesis that all the men of the city came and surrounded Lot's house, 
If you keep reading in the Hebrew, and the King James actually translates it the best, it says not just the men of the city, but all the people of the city, including young and old. That means boys and girls, men and women. The Hebrew term is general for humanity, that all of the people. And how do we know this from this narrative itself? Abraham says, if there's ten righteous, will you not spare it? God is like, no, young and old are corrupted. Male and female are corrupted in the city. And they said, we want those angels to come out so that we may know them. We, because of looking at uh, earlier in Genesis, it said Adam knew Eve and they conceived. We believe it has some kind of physical, intimate connotation. They wanted to know these strangers so they can interrogate these strangers and do what they did to everyone. They were inhospitable, they were violent, and God was done with it. No, pastor, it's because they wanted to be with. No, why would Lot offer his daughters if that's what the men wanted? That wouldn't make any sense. Hello? Not that he should have offered his daughters anyways. That's a whole other sermon. But the point I'm trying to make here is that God stood up to violent, bloodthirsty cities where he said enough is enough is enough. And if Jesus didn't step in, and slow sin down, it would be even more cruel because Sodom and Gomorrah would continue to terrify and haunt and terrorize everyone around them. And I've already said this to you before, I'm going to say it again. Not even those who bring terror like living in their own cities. How many evil dictators lived in paranoia because of their own wickedness? They were afraid everyone was just as evil as they were. God steps in in mercy. He has always stepped in in mercy. And because that is his true motivation, when we turn from our sinful ways, God's mercy just goes, oh, okay. We don't need to apply the mercy in this way. We can now apply it in this way. When the Bible says God changes not, it doesn't mean that God will not change the way that he might uh, uh, operate in certain situations. It means that God's heart never changes. His character never changes. You still don't believe? Will you believe the Adventist commentary? If we have that, let's put that up real quick here. In the fourth volume of our Adventist commentary set, Ray Cottrell, who's one of the editors and has, has passed away, uh, has a great write-up on um, the nature of conditional prophecy. And when you, if you can, uh, you can put that up there. But I just want to read a, a couple uh, uh, parts from this. And this is, this, is the, uh, this is the volume that deals with Isaiah all the way through all the minor prophets. This closes out the Old Testament before it goes into the New but I just want to look at the highlighted parts here. You, you, you guys can go back online and watch it on YouTube and, and freeze frame it. But it says the plan itself never changes. This is what the author's saying here. And he's, he's using many different scriptures as well as <laughs> the spirit of prophecy. The plan itself never changes because God never changes. But the manner in which it is carried out may change because man may change. The fickle human will is the weak, unstable factor in conditional prophecy. Let's go down just a little bit more. It says, the next highlighted part, it should be remembered that God does not force the human will and that Israel's cooperation was essential to the success of his plan for the nation. God promises, God's promises are made conditional upon man's cooperation and obedience. Now, some of you might say, well, but I don't know if I can, I can, I can vibe all the way with that. No, 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 watch this. Even with Abraham, and we've been studying this in the book of Galatians on Wednesday night prayer meeting. Uh, even in the book of Galatians where Paul, Pastor Ivars, states that, that, that Abraham was considered righteous because he believed. He believed, and that is why he received the promise. That that's the reason why he and Sarah were able to have children. But may I add, if, if Abraham and Sarah never decided to lie with one another, would they have received the promise? Don't make me spell it out. At 100 years old, 
Sarah at 90 years old, if they said, oh, nah, nah, we've tried this. Stuff don't work the same way. We good. If they decided not to be obedient and come together as husband and wife, would she have conceived a child? So them coming together intimately is how the promise was fulfilled. Now, sure, he didn't have to obey all of the law, right? But he had to, in obedience, have a part to play. Amen? All of God's promises, all of God's promises involve some human involvement, some way for it to be fully complete. And meaning this, meaning this, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, so if whosoever believes, you get the blessings, right? But if you don't believe, what happens? God finally respects the distance, right? Prophecy always has a conditional component to it, and I'm going to say this, and I'm going to say it, uh, and please don't, don't, don't let it affect the gifts you give us for appreciation. None of the pastors are in on this with me. None of the pastors are in on this with me. But I'm going to say this. Let's go back to the last word, and we're closing. I told you to put a pin in this word. I told you to put a pin in this word where we talked about uh, um, God was going to, uh, this is in verse, in verse uh, 4, his journey crying out, 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown, overthrown. That Hebrew word, that Hebrew word is hafach. It's probably not great Hebrew, but hafach. And it means to turn away or to turn or it can mean overthrown based on context. So in, in Exodus 7.20, in Exodus 7.20, chapter 7, verse 20, the Nile River was turned into blood. That word was used. Exodus 10.19, the Lord shifted the wind. That word was used. Exodus 14.5, the servants had a change of heart. That word was used. In 40 days, it could be overthrow or it could be change. In 40 days, Nineveh will change. I will change the hearts of the Ninevites. Now, some might say, but the Ninevites, they didn't even trust God. How would they ever even turn their hearts to him? He, he, he meant nothing to them. No, 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 no. These pluralistic societies, they believed in other gods. They believed other nations. Think of it as the NFL. There was a league of gods, and these teams played against each other. And some teams overpowered on one Sunday, and some overpowered on a Monday night. And, and, and one nation might win the Super Bowl. So they knew who Israel's team captain was. They had heard. They knew the story. They knew the history. They knew how many Super Bowls the Israelites had won. So when, no, when, when Jonah shows up and he begins to prophesy, I go, oh, he plays, he plays for the Israelites. Oh, man, they got a good quarterback. They good. Man, you know what they did to the Egyptians? Ooh, I don't want to mess with their God. You know what? Jesus, take the wheel. Right? This is how these nations operated. God was changing. So even when we look at God's purpose with prophecy and punishment, discipline, however you want to call it, with prophecy and punishment, the, the foretelling, God has always, always, always been redemptive. Here comes the part you may not like. That means in our es uh, eschatology, as we unfold prophecies and unpack them and say who is going to be the lamb-like beast and who is, who is the harlot and, and, and who, who, who is the dragon and all this kind of stuff, it is possible, family, it is possible that our prophetic words, even with the Catholic Church, may change. You can call the conference tomorrow. I, listen, I'll take my walking papers. This is so important for you to get. God's purpose and prophecy is always to change hearts. Peter, you're going to deny me. No, I won't. Peter, you are. I know your heart, man. Listen to me now. Jesus was hoping in that moment that Peter would repent and say, Lord, right now, you know me. My heart isn't there yet. Peter did not have to deny Christ. The prophetic word of Jesus' purpose was redemptive, Judas included. All along, Jesus was preparing Judas. 
Listen, I know there's someone among us And on the last night, he finally has to call him out. The one who'll be dipping in the salsa with me. If Judas was listening to the Spirit, he would have stopped in his tracks and he would have repented. Oh, Jesus would have been taken maybe another night. They may have gotten him early in the morning. If Judas was not necessary. And I have more stuff in our commentary that speaks to this. This says that had the Israelites accepted Jesus, they would have been so far ahead of the game. Christ, they says, still would have died. He didn't have to be crucified, though. No one takes my life. I give it up on my, on my own accord. I give it up. I take it back. Hello? I don't need Pilate. I don't need Judas. I don't need Peter. I'll lay on the altar and feel the separation before my father. I was bleeding in the garden of Gethsemane before anyone laid a finger on me. My spirit was sorrowful even unto death. I don't need your cooperation. The the, the plan of redemption did not require man having to lift a finger. Jesus did it all. But if you want to play a part in it, it's your choice because God does not force human decisions. So family, as a church, as we preach, I would hope one day that denominations come together. Oh, no, no, there you go, pastor. Yes! That we repent and that we learn to love like Jesus and that our faith is built upon the rock and that we live in the truth. Most importantly, how we love one another and how we love God. What's going to happen one day if the Pope shows up in heaven? He says, man, I've been, I've been listening to some people talking about me, and I was convicted. Convicted. What are you going to say? No, 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 no. There's a script you have to read. No, 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 no. No, read your part. It's been prophesied. And what happens, family, if we don't do our part? Will there be another last day church? Because it's not just about wicked turning their hearts, it's also about those who were called, who are righteous, who also turn their hearts in the wrong direction. Could it be possible that we pull a Moses, we don't get to lead anybody into the promised land? Hello? Prophecy is conditional, and I thank God that it is because its purpose is always redemptive. If all it is is for you to prove what's going to happen in the future and prove that you're right and that you know more than everyone else, you've missed the point of the prophetic word. So what are you going to do, family? You heard the word. Is it going to turn you or is it going to overthrow you? It's your choice today. Father God, you hear us. You'll do whatever it takes in mercy to get our attention. You'll do whatever it takes to grab a hold of us. You'll do whatever it takes to reveal yourself to us. Sometimes it happens within disasters, even though you're not the author of those disasters. Sometimes your spirit is still there working. All things work for the good of those who love the Lord, are called according to his purpose. So, Father, we know your purpose will still come through. It will still, it will still be true. You'll make a way out of no way, so we thank you for that. But right now, we don't need any more walls to come tumbling down. We don't need an explosion. We don't need you to withdraw your spirit or no longer hold back the winds. Right now, we want to simply be drawn by your love. We see your character and that everything that you've ever done has been from the motivation of mercy and grace and love. And so we just want to accept that right now, Father. We are Nineveh. Forgive us. We have been lazy because of prophecy. Lazy Christians, lazy followers because we believe we know the end of the story and what part we play, not realizing that even though you said it, you'll take it back. So we're going to get our stuff together right now. We repent, put on sackcloth, whatever it takes, Lord. We come to you right now. We are Nineveh. Thank you for challenging us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.